I'm going to be talking to Dr. Isabel al about a new uh, report that she's written for ID Tech X, uh, Beyond Silicon Thin Film Photovoltaics 2023 to 2033. Now, this is really interesting because the we think of, you know, uh, solar PV are on panels, are on the, they're on our roofs, they're on uh, utility scale solar farms. But the solar thin film, well, it's been around for a while. It's ready now to be applied in many, many other different applications and really kind of revolutionize the Internet of Things, uh, devices, that sort of thing. So welcome to the interview, Isabel. Uh, thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Now, this is really fascinating, and we're going to talk about the applications uh, in just a moment. But when I think of thin film uh, photovoltaic uh, PV, uh, I think of utility scale, because that's where it's been used uh, up to now, right? Yes, that's correct. So the dominant thin film type is cadmium telluride. Um, it comprises almost 5% of the total PV market. And within the US, it accounts for almost 40% of utility scale PV power. So that, that, is, that is a correct presumption to make. Okay. And so, but now we're talking about uh, other types of thin film PV. Uh, and I interviewed you back in August about perovskite and viewers may want to go back on our YouTube channel and, and check that out. And perovskite is like a thin film PV that you can almost paint on things, right? Yes, that's true. So, so um, there are a few other thin film types aside from cadmium telluride, such as perovskites, organics, disensitized, and these apply similar to an ink, um, where they can be um, very flexible, semi-transparent, and as a result of that, they have a wider range of applications than just um, utility scale or rooftop placement. Right, so now we're talking about uh, indoor energy harvesting. Now that's fascinating because I remember, you know, in the early days of, uh, you know, personal uh, calculators, uh, you would have a little a solar uh, panel on your calculator that would use indoor lighting to, to charge the battery. Is that, this is obviously much more sophisticated and powerful, but is that the kind of application we're talking about? Yes, exactly. So a lot of people have looked the fact, because solar cells are called solar cells, a lot of people have looked the fact they can be used indoors under artificial low light conditions. So those calculators, they used to use amorphous silicon, uh, which has since been phased out because their efficiencies are not very high. Whereas these new materials, they can deliver higher efficiencies and, and longer durability and be embedded into a wider, a wider uh, variety of different electronics um, and self-powered devices. So I could be sitting at my desk uh, with the lights on and charging some of the devices, like for instance, if I had a, a you know an Apple Watch, uh, and that watch could be charging while I'm sitting at my desk uh, indoors. Is is that correct? Exactly. So you wouldn't have to keep uh, recharging your device every night. If you if you forget, it's quite a nuisance. Um, you'd constantly have a constant supply of energy from your indoor lighting um, to power your device, and it's time it's uh, time saving and just less of a nuisance to use a solar technology rather than batteries. Well, let's talk about some of the other uh, applications here. Uh, I am really struck by the you know, the ability to uh, use thin film PV around the, the the house. So, for instance, you could use it on on windows. That I mean, there's in an in an office tower, you can imagine it being used there. In a house, there's often you know quite a lot of window space. Uh, is that one of the the most significant applications of this? It's, it's something that is being discussed, but there's, a little, there's not that much movement commercially yet, but this one has been discussed, um, mostly with uh, organics, uh, disensitized and perovskite uh, photovoltaics. Now, because it's been placed in windows, you want it to be long lasting. And organics and disensitized, they suffer from short lifespans. Perovskite photovoltaics could be longer lasting. It can, there are some companies that say they can um, make the technology last as long as 15 to 20 years, in which case embedding it into your window is quite a quite a useful um, investment to make. Um, so yes, that, that's definitely something that is being discussed and being, um, I guess, was, uh, piloted among startups. Now, let's say that I had um, a perovskite uh, uh, PV integrated into my, or you know, put on my uh, windows. Uh, is it likely that we'll get to the point where that would generate enough electricity that I could power my house? That's a good question um, because there are some trade-offs. Trying to, you know, mo uh, modulate the transparency, etc., can sometimes lead to performance decreases. So putting aesthetics ahead of performance can lead to some compromises. 
Um, but it could do one day because perovskites, in terms of their record efficiencies, they are very comparable with silicon. So for the same surface area, you could potentially get the same power output. And um, if you if you were a, a, a skyscraper, an office block, yes, you'd have a lot of real real estate to work with, a lot of windows to work with. And so potentially, yes, you could use it to power um, your entire building. When you say uh, it has roughly the same uh, efficiencies as solar PV, uh, I think in terms of 20, 22%, that kind of efficiency? Well, so Prospect is not yet commercial, so it's hard to talk about typical commercial efficiencies. However, in terms of the academic research, um, yes, they're very similar. So the record efficiency for silicon solar cells is about 26%, and for Prospect it's around 25%. So very, very comparable. And how long until we see these kinds of thin film uh, PVs, perovskite, of course, being only one of them, but how long until we see them uh, in commercial applications? So we should see perhaps in about a year or two, there's a company Oxford PV that is um, making perovskite on silicon tandem. So using both materials, the emerging thin film and the conventional silicon to make an ultra high efficiency uh, solar device. Um, and that's expected to be launched um, next year um, commercially. Now, I, one of the uh, conversations that I always have with, uh, with uh, academics or economists and, and analysts is around learning curves and cost curves. So we, we know what the, uh, the uh, cost curves uh, and learning curves for solar and wind are, for example. And you know, over the course of 10 years, they start and they just, you know, it's, it, they, they decline by a factor of, of 10. Uh, very steep learning curves. Uh, it, can we expect the same sort of curves uh, for you know the the thin film PV? It's a, it's hard to say, but I would I would imagine yes. Um, there's so much research being done on thin film PV because there's renewed interest um, in recent years. I would imagine yes, the cost curve should keep keep uh, decreasing, um, and because the the manufacturing of thin film is relatively or comparatively simple compared to silicon it's much easier to um, keep the innovation going and reduce the cost further. Now, uh, in the North America, and I imagine the same, you're joining us from uh, the UK, uh, so I imagine the same interest in, in Europe. China dominates so much of the solar industry as it does batteries and, and other parts of the clean energy technology supply chains. Is this, a, is thin film PV an area where North America and Europe maybe have a, a an innovation edge, and this might be the sort of next generation of solar technology where they might at very least compete with China or maybe even leapfrog ahead of China? I'm not sure if, so, so silicon and thin film shouldn't be seen as opposites or competitors. They should be seen more as complementary. Um, I wouldn't say that thin film will ever take over from silicon. It is 95% of the market silicon and, um, it looks to be staying that way. However, it is worth investing, I would say, in both technologies. And one of the key drivers for thin film, you're right, is the desire or the growing desire to bring manufacturing back to the US and Europe to a more localized regional level, because it's much easier to get involved in the thin film market than it is the silicon market, which, like you say, it's very dominated by Asia Pacific region. Um, so uh, yes, I think it, it's definitely a worthwhile investment, but will it be a competitor in equal terms to the China silicon industry? I don't think so. Okay, fair enough. Um, so are we seeing the thin film PV uh, startups, the, the firms that are developing this technology, are they primarily located in North America and Europe? And is that where we should, should see, you know, plants being built over the next uh, few years? Yes, yeah, certainly. There, there are startups in Poland and Sweden. Uh, Oxford PV's factory is going to be in Germany. Um, in the US, of course, there's a cadmium telluride industry. So yes, it, it will be uh, independent of China, and you're right to say that there will be a, a growing um, industry within Europe and, and the US. Okay. Uh, now, your uh, your study, uh, you know, goes out, uh, so covers the next decade, goes out to 2033. Uh, we've uh, talked about what might come in the next, uh, say, two three years. Uh, what do you mm -hmm. see happening at the at the other end of that uh, that period? You know, in the latter part of the, the decade. Sure. So um, for the dominant technology, cadmium telluride, I think that will continue to grow. Um, it's already pretty pretty well established, and I imagine it'll have a good upward trend. However, for the other technologies, um, organics and disensitizer are currently commercial on a small scale, and perovskite is up and coming as a, com as a competitor 
to organics um, and disensitize. It's very similar in terms of the chemistry and it's the way it's uh, applied for the solar cells, but it has better efficiencies and potentially better durability. And so I think towards the end of the decade, we might see a phasing out of the uh, organics and disensitized materials and a, a more significant increase towards perovskites. And some organics companies have already said they're interested in transitioning towards perovskite. So I think we will see a, um, an upward trend for, for the perovskite industry. Isabel, thank you very much for this. Really appreciate your insights. Thank you.